Okay. Cool, man. Here we are. Pandemic Conf 2020. <laughs> <laughs> v- virtual Ember Conf 20. Yeah. Um, apocalypse drinking set right down here that I just got. Pretty excited about that. You ain't wrong. <laughs> um, yeah, I think we're the only two people in North Portland. Man. It's pretty crazy. It's very quiet. Pretty quiet. It's quiet downtown. Apparently, That's a Hamilton joke. Apparently, there was a, well, there was a rumor. I actually got it firsthand from someone I know that it's pretty funny these days, you know. But anyways, there's a rumor New York was going to shut down. Mayor Cuomo's shutting down the city. No more subways. <laughs> lockdown. Get your drugs. Get your booze. <laughs> get your food. And then I got it from a friend who got it from a friend who worked in the healthcare industry. And it was like a le- it was a legitimate text. Like here, FYI, I just heard this. And then my friend on Twitter said, every time this happens in New York, this starts going around. And then like an, a few hours later, there's a BuzzFeed article saying that this happens, and then apparently it's like a fake thing. So. Yeah, there's no... <laughs> it, crushing the economy actually has other... caused people to die. So I think people are paying attention. Yeah. I don't think shutting down the entire New York would work. Yeah. So anyways, we're doing our best here, holding it down in the Tilda office. This is pretty cool. Yeah. This is the same office where, where y'all wrote Ember? A lot of ember. The Paris setup, the blog yeah. post. Yeah, a lot of ember. Pretty cool. A lot of ember has been slung in these uh, in these walls. That is true. That's that's a picture of me escaping San Francisco. In the back, <laughs> I'm in the back. I like that. Oh, I can't quite make it out yeah. on the stream, but it's. Uh, you can take a picture and you, you can put in the show notes. You look handsome in it. Actually, mm-hmm. you look good. The so you. You look fearless. The, the guy who did that <laughs> was a digital. He made um, video game box art in the 90s. Cool. And Tom Dale convinced him that to come out of retirement. To Wait, make, really? Yeah, I'm serious. I love it. So he, uh, he came down and he put us all in the outfits. Like those outfits, he basically put us, down, put us in those outfits and took pictures of us. And then he hand drew high resolution this whole thing. That is amazing. <laughs> I'm definitely going to take a picture of this and include it because it's, uh, it's quite it's, something. It's quite something. If you look very closely <laughs> at, the, at the glow on the, on the firefly, it's uh, ones and zeros. You have to look very closely. Wow. And this guy has dedication. That's pretty good. Yeah. All right. Um, so yeah, we're here. Uh, Ember Conf happening virtually. So we still got a keynote. To look forward to and yep. we still have a bunch of talks to look forward to i thought my keynote was done but now a lot of things have changed in the world and i have to probably care about that yes uh we um we also we're going to put on trainings here live and now we're going to do them kind of virtually so yeah the last few days have been pretty crazy yeah. for everyone it's, i'm actually generally pretty psyched that everyone is trying to still do like a virtual emberconf plan came together and i'm happy about that but Really, it only is possible because everyone who was planning on doing stuff is still trying to do stuff. Uh, the workshops are the hardest, so like, yeah. thank you. Yeah, I think um, it'll be fun. We'll just pause the video and say, listen, pause the video, do the exercises now. You know, there's no one there to slap your hand, but but um, we'll, yeah, I think it's gonna be good actually. So uh, yeah. I'm excited about it because it's always fun building these demo apps for the trainings, you know? We kind of go yes. a little bananas with them embed servers and Ember CLI and, uh, you know, make whole UIs to kind of help you understand things. So it's always actually a pretty fun time. Me and Tom used to do trainings like uh, 2015 or something. And we, yeah, we also, we made a, a music playing app, like a Spotify clone. That was the three day course. And yeah, we always had to do surprising things. I stayed up many a late night. Yeah, that's usually, Ryan and I usually come here and we're at our Airbnb in the Pearl District and we're just like burning midnight oil. But usually it's by choice. Like we're excited about some aspect of the demo thing that could totally be left out. But um, we always try to make tests that fail. They have to make pass mm-hmm. and that itself is a very tricky yes. constraint. Yes, but fun too. Yes. Um, Cool, man. So we've been we've been talking for a while, lots we can cover here. But uh, why don't we start with just some of the things that's been on your mind? You know, um, you had two blog posts come out recently that uh, I really enjoyed and um, talked a lot about the history of Ember, and I think talked a little bit about where you see it going next, or at least the influences that are are driving you to do the work right now. Kind of what your focus is. So um, maybe a good place to start would be, um, I guess, this is going to come out. This will come out after the keynote. Yeah. So I can talk about. So we can talk about things. things. I, our announcement, generally speaking, the core team told me to stop making announcements. Yeah, yeah, sure. So there's relatively few. Um, and in, the funny thing is we have to do everything. Everything is a community project. So it's actually really hard for us to hide stuff. Yeah. And it's actually a fun game to see like how much stuff you can hide, given that everything is in plain view. Yeah. 
I, I, there have been years where people were like, how is it possible that nobody knew that? <laughs> like the Glimmer JS year. Yeah, like, yeah. What the hell? And like the whole, you go back, it's like been a public repo the whole time yeah. that people could have found. So I think we could just actually focus on the things you think are most important and interesting. Let's assume that you've already given the keynote, right? And we can yeah. talk about it. Yeah. So I think a lot of what got me started this year is I saw I saw a video talk something with uh, former Surgeon General Vivek Murthy. And he, he, when he was Surgeon General, deci like discovered that there is a loneliness epidemic in the United States, which every time I say that, I know like half the audience is like eye roll. That sounds like some ridiculous thing. How, what does it even mean for loneliness to be an epidemic? But uh, he, Vivek Murthy, like cared, when he was Surgeon General, cared enough about it to say that it was the top uh, threat to our, our health. And, and something that we that was true back then, but um, we know more now, is that when people are lonely, it actually increases physical disease. So for example, um, it increases the rate of heart disease and um, a lot of other physical ailments, dementia even. Um, and uh, what more or less the state of the science on that is loneliness is as bad for you as smoking a pack a day or, um, uh, being an alcoholic, roughly in that ballpark. It's pretty bad. Yeah, pretty bad. And I, it, we, I don't think we have an. Is, it, is, is watching an episode of Friends like it counteracting the pack of little, cigarettes? Probably helps a little. Probably helps a little. But and I think we don't have an intuition for what that means. I think in part because there's a sense in which you know sometimes even with depression it took a lot of effort. People thought, oh, depression's like being sad, being very sad. Get over it. Yeah. You like, know. like you don't like don't like you, you're. Like, what's the problem? You were sad, like be less sad. And there's like a similar situation with loneliness where it's just like sad doesn't sound very serious. Uh, lonely doesn't sound very serious. I am not a public health professional, so I'm not going to figure out the marketing for the problem. <laughs> but there isn't a good word that is the equivalent of clinical depression for lonely. That validates it. Right. And I think that that probably is a problem, by the way. But um, putting that aside, there is a there is an equivalent thing, which is um, when people are very lonely, it creates the problem that causes all those physical ailments. Um, there's good TED Talks that will enumerate the physical elements in detail, and you're going to be like very shocked by the amount of them. Like I said, heart disease and dementia are some of them, but there's 10 or something. Uh, that's how it becomes as dangerous as smoking cigarettes. And like that story was a sufficient, was a big shock because like I, I didn't, exp just like everyone, the first time you hear loneliness is a serious problem, it doesn't sound like that serious of a thing. Um, on the other hand, I think, first of all, once you start thinking about it, it and I, I want to say a little more about it, but I, once you start thinking about it, it becomes apparent that it's like more serious than you think. And the more I started thinking about it, the more I saw that like a lot of movies are actually talking about loneliness, like Frozen's main song has the phrase, a kingdom of isolation in it. Um, and I, it's just really common. Um, the, the show Come From Away, which is about 9-11, ha, uh, has a song where they're like, it's a, it's a show where they took... It's a, uh, there's a city of 7,000 people and like uh, 28 planes full of 9-11 people who were grounded there. And so you have a city that had 7,000 people, suddenly has 20,000 people. Um, and it's a really cool play, I think, if people have a chance to see it. It, it was shocking to me when I saw it that a play about 9-11 could feel both not so depressing, but also not silly. Right? It's, it's hard to strike that balance. And, and I didn't leave it feeling sad or depressed, but I also didn't feel like oh, they like made light of it. I, I think you have to see it to get it, but I think they did a good job. But there's, there's a song in there that has the phrase, um, I feel so alone, right? In the middle of a play, a play that is fundamentally about like a city of 7,000 people getting 20,000 people in it, right? And, and they're, it's talking about the fact that they're surrounded by people they don't know, right? It's, it's all these people from, they're on a plane, right? So you don't know anybody. They're not from your city. So you're surrounded by all these people and everybody feels alone. And, and the more I look around, the more I see that like so much actually culture has the, is infused with the concept of people feeling lonely. Again, that feels like it's easy to, it takes a few hits. It takes a few times of hearing this before you like start taking it seriously, which is again, a marketing problem for the, for this issue, um, a public health issue. But it really is a thing that I think people feel. Um, one thing that I want to say about it is um, loneliness. What like it feel like the feeling that people have from like culture is loneliness is the feeling of not having people around you or whatever. Um, 
that's true. That's part of it. But a big part of it also is like feeling low self-worth, feeling like no one cares about you. Right. And I think if you, those kind of things are, or like feeling that you can't get like nobody, uh, the things that you do don't matter to anybody. Right. And those are the kind of things that I think a lot of people feel without necessarily calling them lonely. Right. It, 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 I think when you feel, I think if you think about it, you'll realize that when you feel unlonely, those things happen less. <laughs> Right. You like somebody cares about you. So you can't it's hard to feel like nobody cares about you if, if you're like have a loving relationship or a child um, or enough of that or extended family you have a big extended family. It's hard to feel alone. But part of that is that you don't feel like nobody cares about you. Mm. Right. So th there's this phenomenon. And I think part of it is like in modern society, like people are living in you can live in a city, you could live in an apartment and like not know any of your right. neighbors, even though you're living in like the densest society in human history. You can work remotely, you can order things online, social media. Yep. You can like we're getting to the point where you don't have to ever leave your house. Yeah. And like people do that. Like yeah. you might think, oh, that's silly. Like who is not leaving their house? That was a good joke in, when the net came out in 1998. Yeah. And like now we're living in that yeah. exact world that the net was making fun of as okay. an absurd thing. So, so this is an important thing for you. So, so it, it struck me, I think. Yeah, it struck and, you. And like what I sort of, I, how it has connected to Ember is I realized there's, there's a, how it already connects to Ember and how I think it should connect to Ember. How it already connects to Ember is that Ember is, I think, unique among, I think Rails has this a little, a lot, maybe. Well, and you touched this on, on your blog posts. Basically, there's an important aspect of your journey as a programmer. Yes, yes. I, I, so uh, Ember is, uh, is pretty, is, I don't want to say unique. I'm always scared to say unique. Someone says, what about this thing? I, I, there are probably things. Um, Elixir actually is pretty good at this. But it's a strong value. Yeah, it, Ember has a very, very strong value. And it's, it's unusual in, in code communities of actually trying to make people together bring people together and i part of that is like you know people like meetups whatever but a big part of it is just like making the making the community think that when we do stuff we should do it together when we octane as a as a technical artifact doesn't really have any features in it right like if you look at octane that was why it's so hard to talk about it's like octane doesn't have any features all the features already landed all octane actually is is we're all going to take this step at the same time Right. And it's the part of what was so confusing about Octane is like in a lot of other communities, it's like even impossible to talk about it. There's n there's no way to say it because there's no in all all react developers take this step together is not a thing. Right. So now there's nothing wrong with that. You like a lot of very, very big communities. The Postgres community doesn't need it. Right. And, like there are very big communities that are a technology and they're not a community. That, that's not the point of them. Um, or they're a community, but it's a loose, loose confederation. If you go to the React community website, not like nothing wrong with this, it says um, React has a million developers. Here is a list of community resources that you might be interested in, right? And, and that's just not what Ember is. Like, that, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's just a different thing than what Ember is. So that's like, it is already the case that, you know, I remember I got on the, f I, I was pinged by somebody in the 113 era who was making people upset in the community. I'm not going to name any names. And uh, I pinged the person and I asked them, okay, uh, you know, what's bothering you? Cause that's like, that's what I do. <laughs> I try to, I try, I, I have a rule that I try, like if somebody is being annoying, I, I reach out, I reach out. I think uh, I, in private, I, my joke is hashtag reach out. And like, I, I, I think it's important value people. You would be amazed like how much reaching out just like diffuses yeah, situations like some like you you I, I talked about this in my blog post about dhh which is an example of that but like it makes a big deal there's some things that there's some like dehumanizing ways of thinking about people that like just don't make any sense once you talk to them at all yeah they build right. up in your mind and then you're like wait they're a complete true. fabrication yes and sometimes you can make them true by never talking to that person like now it's just too bad. It's a vicious cycle. So I reached out to this person um, and I said, okay, what's going on? This person was really angry at Ember 113, which in retrospect is not a totally absurd thing to believe. Um, but what it turned out is that this person had invested a lot of, uh, of energy convincing their company to use Ember. Um, even back then we had sort of a story about stability. I think the story changed, um, but we had a story about it and they like finally got their team on Ember 112. <laughs> They invested all this emotional energy in, in like really putting their person, their self-worth, their, their identity at the company as like the person who is going to bet on Ember. 
And then you know, a couple months later, we're like, never mind. Like, hey guys, we're just gonna. And to be clear, I think we really thought we were doing the right thing at the time. We Angular had announced Angular two, which was like a huge break, and we were like, we're not gonna do that. We're gonna like deprecate a lot of things and and like help people migrate. So we actually did that. There yeah, was there was a that. deprecation strategy. It, yes, it was just we deprecated a lot of We've things. We've evolved on once. it since then. Yes. So. Uh, what was important about that conversation was that when I talked to that person, it, what, that person wasn't like a bad person and they weren't like necessarily like mad at us or whatever. They were just really betrayed. <laughs> they felt betrayed for a good, like very valid reasons that I didn't understand at all before I talked to them. Um, and so what, like what came out of that conversation is that in the 2X era, in the Ember 2X era, like, first of all, we didn't do that again. But second of all, we invested a ton of effort into building infrastructure that allowed us to move together so that we wouldn't have to do that again. And that includes thing. I talked about this in the blog post a bit, but that includes things like we're going to make an RFC to move to Discord so that we're like actually all on the same page and have a conversation in a reasonable way. Like, not that we're being reasonable, but that it's a uh, structured conversation that everyone's in. <laughs> um, we had you know, RFCs about the new website, which like, is, as far as I know, not much of a thing outside of Ember. Um, and then I think you might have opinions about that, but like, whatever it is, we could talk about that if you want to. Um, no, but you're just talking about the, the actual decision-making process. Yes, I think in general- Being a first-class thing. In general, we invested a lot in just, so those are some of the things. Another, some of the things are like Glimmer 1 was Ember 113. Glimmer 2 was a drop and replacement that no one had to care about. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was, I would say it's the same level of technological innovation, but we just put more energy in the 2X era. It took longer, but nobody had to, but no one was left behind, right? I think is the thing. Um, and then in general, we retooled the deprecation process so that every deprecation is required to both be, remove, you have to remove the deprecated feature from the whole guides. So the, the deprecation, the deprecated feature can't be used anymore in the way that we explain Ember. And the, there has to be a deprecation guide that tells you for like, basically all cases of people using that feature, what the transition plan is, if possible, code mods and things like that. But the critical thing is that when we deprecate a feature, what that means is that, like you can think of the guides as a description of how to build an Ember app for everyone, the whole community. Mm -hmm. And so when we deprecate something, we have to make sure that the new thing, the, the Ember without that thing, like makes sense to describe that way, mm -hmm. right? So that like, that sounds like a technocratic change to the deprecation policy, but what it's really about is make sure that when we change Ember, we're every, like there's, we do our level best to bring everyone along. Mm -hmm. And I think since the 1X era, if you look at like the an annual survey, we actually do quite a good job of making active Ember users use it. And, th and this is like, this has good technical benefits. Um, if you're not able to invest a ton in your one person, Right or you're a handful of people. Well, Skylight has six, seven engineers, not all of whom work on the Ember app all the time. Um, that means that you can like always be working on your app and relatively little time spent on the upgrade process. And that's like a thing you put in the feature section of the sales pitch. But again, what it's actually about is saying that the whole Ember community is together doing the same thing always, right? And that that means that like our most uh, our newest developer all the way to our most senior. So our most senior developer here is me. I have been working on Ember since it existed. Um, our least experienced developer is a few year, like a, a couple years out of bootcamp. Uh, although Leia is uh, taking a bootcamp now and might, will become our most inexperienced developer soon. Um, and we can like, what's awesome about Ember for us is we actually did start Ember before the, like before 1.0, basically we started using it here for Skylight. Today, Skylight is on the most recent version, and the entire team from the least experienced developer to the most experienced developer works on that app together, and there's not a massive amount of friction about, and we, not a lot of friction, and we keep upgrading. Like, it's just like, it's on the calendar every six weeks, like some person on the team takes, does the work to like do the upgrade process. It's kind of invisible to the yeah. normal flow. And that's like- And it's not, I mean, if that was just Tilda doing it, that would be right. very, so we just skylight. Survive. It would be different because you, you know, maintain Ember. Yes, I hear that story in lots of places. There's lots of companies who use Ember who are on the latest version who feel like upgrades are invisible. So just wanted to yes, point that I, out. You had a good tweet about this that is actually in the keynote. So 
It's I like, think I saw in your blog post. Yeah. Yeah. I put in the blog post also. And like, I think what's, I, even myself, I think of myself as like two people. There's like the Yehuda that works on Ember and there's the Yehuda that works on Skylight. And even for myself, I like, like to be able to work on Skylight without thinking about the Ember stuff. It's like a yeah, productivity yeah. booster for me. For, for sure. I'm, I'm exactly the same way when I'm doing it versus when You're I'm teaching Mirage something. Or using it, right? Or even with Ember, like if I'm uh, helping someone, um, you know, uh, yeah, Mirage is a, is a better example for sure. Um, yep. you, you see the, the boundaries when yep. they're wrong. I, I also just wanted to point out as you were talking about that, you know, we've been doing React development on the, you know, in addition to our Ember development, I would say for about a year now. And so I've been learning a lot about that community. We came in to start learning React at an interesting time when, you know, after hooks had been announced. Um, but I was just listening to a podcast episode, the React podcast that came out like this week. And um, one of the guests was saying in his consulting and training, you know, um, he still talks to folks and companies who are like, um, yeah, you know, hooks, like we just haven't used, adopted them yet. Like we're just sticking with like our components, like, you know, eventually we'll get it. And he's kind of like, you missed the boat. Like there was a huge paradigm shift here and you're missing out on a lot of things. And so, um, I think, again, going back to like, w this is a good example of like different values, not one being uh, strictly better or worse, just having them be very different, where um, hooks wasn't meant to be a new way. Of, I mean, it is a new way of doing everything, but there's also lots of code that exists with like classic yeah. React components. And so, but there and is think, definitely a huge you, gap. I think uh, Vue is also like this, right? The Vue describes the composition API as it's not replacing the old API. It's the new API. It's a new API that you could use if it makes sense for you. The yeah. hooks is also described the same way. I think actually the people who are are I think most of the like the core team and the kind of um, Twitterati I guess would say like there's basically there's like one API you can't do with hooks that you that you can with class components, but basically like there's no reason all your code shouldn't be hooks right. I, I, with the exception of like the upgrade path and like the mental jump and, and stuff like so that. So I think this is actually a really good way of seeing what Ember does differently because back when Ember and Angular were arguing, Angular was like, we have to make a breaking change technically. And that was actually because the technical difference was so stark, we could easily say, yes, we're not going to make a breaking change. Yeah. Um, but actually the thing that we did at that time was bad. It was it did it fractured the community, yeah. right? And now everybody learned from the Angular yeah. two mistake, so nobody does that anymore. Yeah. So now the now the question is tr is honest. It's, it's are you doing Ember one thirteen or not? Yeah, no, that's actually I, I'm really glad you said that because that was the reason why I thought about React and Hooks and this podcast that I thought about that I had just listened to because Hooks wasn't a, a breaking change; it's yep. an additive API. But y if you look at how the community has adopted it or where they haven't. It's very, it's very different from the story that we're talking about Ember. And so the breaking change thing is like, maybe we all come to a place where we're, we can agree, like breaking changes are pretty bad. And so and try to like integers are not free. It turns out, even though yeah. I like to say that a few years ago. Yeah, 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 They're, exactly. The integer is free, but the community but that, yes. the effect is not free. Yeah, yeah. And, and also, but like, even if you're on the same page about that, there's actually two ways to handle this problem. Right. And, um, and, uh, you know, adding a, a new paradigm shifting API like hooks that is again, not backwards incompatible, but is like a big enough shift. It's a big enough shift that it, um, it, 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 and it's disconnected enough from the kind of old way of doing things that there's going to be a lot of folks who are hesitant to move on to it. That's something to consider. Right. Um, whereas, uh, like the Ember model is more, um, it's, it's like, let's not change the entire thing. Um, even if maybe we think there's something that's like we've learned, we're going to have place more of an emphasis on how it's going to look for people who are in this old world. I think I actually want to get into the nuances here because this is kind of true about a lot of my open source work, but it's especially true here. The details really matter and the details are very invisible in part because what we're actually trying to do is communicate that we should all move together. And if we're communicating all the details, we actually fail at that. So it's yeah. unless you're like reading all the RCs very carefully and all the core notes, you can't tell. So let me like pull back the curtain for a second here. So um, actually one of the things that went wrong in the, so the two X era was like invest in community. But one of the things that went wrong was that we were taking two steps that were too big. Right. So we would say, oh, we're going to do module unification. That step would take like really forever. Um, and so infinite actually, uh, yes, <laughs> never, never finished. Right. And so divide by zero error. So what I think what, what we learned from that is 
technically, from a technical perspective, we can't actually front load the design of like the whole new system and also front load the like land it all before you can do land any of it. Mm -hmm. Even though we have, you know, we feature flags, we can do that. Right. But what was happening was that everything was too coupled together and we weren't like technically making enough progress. Mm -hmm. And so like kind of the way to think about the 3X era is that we decoupled like when we land stuff fr from when we move the community. And so uh, part of that means that so what landing stuff is it's basically really, again an acknowledgement that these are two separate things two the things. breaking change or the api changes versus how we navigate a 112 or 113 situation yes. that are two separate and things. unlike you know tw uh in 2005 when everyone would say oh the answer is make a breaking major change bump there's no reason to do that that major basically you have to you want to dis disconnect technically whether you broke something from moving the community forward which frankly is better if it's not happening during a breaking change release because that means that people don't have to stop the world to do the upgrade right so uh, so so what i what i wanted to say was basically we decided okay we really need to start landing pieces of angle of glimmer components a little at a time because like we're just not succeeding at doing the feature and so godfrey made this plan that was like 15 steps or whatever and we're just gonna you know every release we're gonna start with like removing dot get just that that's the only thing and part of like Part of the argument for that was that it is okay to have we, what we call an incoherent state, but it's really only incoherent from the perspective of the program out. If from that perspective, React right now is in an incoherent state because like half the community is using hooks and the other half of the community is using React.create class, right? So that, that's when people hear incoherent state, they shouldn't think Ember is broken. It's really, it's talking about fragmentation. Right. That's, what that's what we mean, right? Or, and maybe like the fragmentation is inevitable because only really eager early adopters can even use the feature right now because like other pieces that would make it really work aren't there yet. But, but it's not about stability, right? We land, the, and, and the point is you want to minimize, you land features as soon as you're willing to make stability commitments. And that is not the same thing as when all the other parts are done, right? So, that, so that's like a technical change that we made. And then the other thing that we did was we said, okay, now that we did the technical thing and people could start, you know, people were able to use .get in like January or December 2018 or something, right? And people were not able use to use .get. Not use .get. And people were able to use native classes like two years ago, right? So, so now, given that we started landing the features a little at a time, okay, what is the actual point of Octane? The actual point of Octane is to say, hey, everybody, now, now everybody is using Octane, right? And that, it turns out that like making that happen was a massive community innovation project. It wasn't, it, it, we actually got a lot of benefit from the fact that the Rust team did it first, which maybe people don't know, like the Rust addition process is approximately the same thing. I, I happened to be on the Rust core team at the time and I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, watch how this goes, right? right? And let, let's try all this idea out. Right. Um, Rust has, I'm not gonna get into it. Um, Rust is a little different for various reasons, but not not that much different and the so the ember community is basically like okay now we like we actually already landed the features like that's not the issue now the issue is how we we don't want to announce to people hey it's a good time to start using and stop using dot get everybody right. like we that, it's not that we hit it as you know it was right. in the release notes if people really wanted to not use dot get that's totally fine but actually at that time you still have to use dot set and that's like a little weird right, right? so like we didn't want to like retool the all the docs so that they like keep having to be updated a little at a time and so really what octane was about was saying okay if what we're trying to do is take the community and give it make it have us take a step together what does that mean so what it has to mean is like the technical risk is low and basically people yeah there's disconnected people can yes. continue to work like they're used to doing yes. and get the technical pieces yes. out of and the so, way so like early adopters already did a lot of the legwork to make sure the features work mm -hmm. right because they landed they want to like try using months. angle brackets immediately right and those people like really flushed so that actually gave de-risk the technical side yeah. um we had a different documentation um in the background the whole time that was like removed all the classic features so we, we don't call them legacy features or deprecated features because they are not deprecated in all cases we just call them classic features and in, in our in the octane case so we we ha we left the classic features around in the main guides at the same time we were iterating on um as we landed features updating the like keeping on retooling the the background guides that 
that you didn't use that, mo that weren't the main guides that most developers used. They were for early adopters to like, okay, now we can remove that set. Oh, we have track properties. Now we can add, we can retool all the example. We have native classes. We can retool all the examples, right? If we had done that in the main guides, people who were trying to use Ember would be like, oh my God, like yeah. every, I, every time I look at the guides, I, they look completely different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So, th so we had to like really think about how to move the documentation. We had to think about, um, writing tools so that people who are using curly braces could upgrade to angle brackets and like for various reasons, those tools are not totally trivial because even, like two things that might look exactly the same are actually not always talking. So we can use clever static tricks and some dynamic tricks, right? Um, we built, we actually had to update the Ember inspector. So like part of the deal here is that the Ember project's scope is, it's not like people often think it's like gigantic. It's not gigantic. It just actually includes all the things that you need to have to build an app. That's like the actual scope of it. It's the stuff that most people need to build an app. Mm -hmm. Turns out a router is one of those things. Mm -hmm. Um, so the developer tools is one of those things. And we like, weren't willing to ship to say to people, let's take the step together until the, the, the inspector actually had, um, support for angle brackets in the way, like in the same way that the cur curly braces support worked. Right. So there's all these details. I had a Kanban board, um, at one point that had all the, all the steps and actually the last like two or three releases had no features in them. It, it just had, are the code mods done yet? Mm -hmm. Right. And so what is, what that means is. There's a, like maybe 10% of the community is enthusiastic early adopters. And that 10% is like really banging on it right there. You know, Tilda is that group. We were, you know, we ran the code mod to change the angle brackets and it like changed all of our white space and created problems. And then we like manually updated it and filed bugs. Right. And so by the, but by the time we were ready to say, Hey community, now let's take the step forward. The other 90% of the community that was just like hearing that Octane was a thing, watching talks, maybe in some, maybe 10% more is like getting excited about it. Um, now the other 80 or 90% of the community is like, Oh, Octane's out. It's a new, th like now I could take the step and all the th stuff is there. Right. And th that stuff is like what Octane is really about. And it's like, doesn't actually fit into the technical feature list or the Semver system, right? right? It's, it's like right. really just innovating in how you move a community together. And again, right. part of why this, this um, description takes a long time is because it's actually not, not every community knows how to even, it has a way of talking about it. Like in a lot of communities, there's just no attempt to make everyone move together. And, and as you said before, that's, that's fine. Like the, the, the hooks thing, we wouldn't, we don't do it because that's not our way. Our way is to try to move people together. And, and like, maybe if you're really into the react way, you're like, oh, you guys are doing a bad thing, right? You like real, you're slowing everything down empirically. Like, um, let me, let me minor rent. There's certainly trade-offs. I, I want to make a minor rant and then I want to admit <laughs> the trade-offs. So minor rant is because of the fact that Ember announces features when they are ready for every hundred percent of our, or like, let's say 95% of our users to migrate to. And React announces features when they are, do not even exist yet. And I, there's nothing wrong with that. Again, I think that's a totally, I'm not like upset that Dan Abramov announced concurrent mode when it didn't exist yet. Like, that's fine. But because of that gap, it really looks like React is like massively ahead. Concurrent okay, mode but didn't ship yet. Sure, sure, sure. But setting that aside, and it's not even just about React. Again, the, the same podcast I was listening to was talking, it was Michael Jackson talking about React Router. And, um, you know, I think in the same way that a lot of Ember's values leak out into the library and add-on authors, the React values and ethos of the core team leak, leak out yeah. and, and influence the, the libraries. And so, Which is good. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's just how it is. And so uh, Michael was talking about how from React Router 3 to 4, they had this idea to improve the API and they, they did it. And um, like a lot of people were stuck on like 3. And now you have four or five, which are basically the same. And like, it's, there's like another split. And there's so there's also a reach router. Yes. But there are basically six version six is what he was talking about in this particular podcast. And it was a lot of work is going into how to bring all these kind of groups together. But the point being that, um, the, no, the, it's just, there is a trade-off obviously. Yes. And, and they're seeing that they're, they're starting to bend the trade-off curve back, but they, they erred on the side of like giving yep. the, what they thought at the time was the best API as fast as possible. Yep. Um, and so now there's some bending and, and in yes. the same way there, there is the same, in I yeah. think there's an orientation, right? I think, yeah. I think in a, in a really optimal, perfect world, which we will never get to because the context shifts under our feet all the time. So like, we're never going to actually get to the perfect answer for either React or Ember. Cause by the time we would be able to do that, we like, we're moved on to something else. Like it's too many of the details. I don't even know if there is a perfect answer. I think though. there's like the, in terms of bending the curve, like if you draw the yeah. curve, there's like, 
I could talk about what I think the perfect answer for Ember would theoretically be, but but we're not gonna. Nobody's gonna get there. Um, but well, the reason there would even be a notion of a perfect concept for Ember is because of your tastes and preferences and the tastes but, and preferences of the Ember so not, not developers, quite, not right? Quite. I think basically, like, so let's like dig into your trade off. So the trade off is um, if. So Evan Yu from View talks about it. I want to quibble with how he talks about it, but I want to I want to start with how he talks about it. So the way he talks about it is, when you have a community like Ember that centralizes all the changes, then you have to wait for the central authority to decide to change something, and that's like good news because everybody moves together. But it's bad news because you have to wait for the central authority to change something. Um, whereas in in the case of something like React, basically people do whatever like all the time. People are making it's very decentralized, and the cost of that is fragmentation and like. Evan's point is like Vue tries to be in the middle, right? And that that's fine. The, I that's I think everyone agrees that those two forces are important. Mm -hmm. Like some version of both of those forces is important. And if you go too hard on either direction, you don't succeed. The quibbling. Yeah, I, I mean that was basically Michael's admission. Uh, yes. You know, admission. He's just saying, look, we're going to come back a little bit this time. There's a ton of apps out there built with all this stuff. And if we take a, a little bit of extra time and slow down on the feature stuff or the new innovative APIs, there's no reason we can't provide a way for these people to come along. But it's still somewhere else. It's somewhere yes. on the curve. And, that, and that's because both, like, there's costs. Like, in any other diminishing returns curve, the more extreme you get, the less you benefits you're getting and more costs. So like, just don't be there. Right. And so the, the quibbling I want to do is I think, I don't think anybody really is as extreme. Like for example, react as much as you think they're like very community oriented, they're actually doing the hooks thing and Ember, I want to talk about, we do experimentation. Yeah. Right. And, and so I think what I mean when I say the perfect, there's a perfect answer for Ember, it's not just about community values. I think we start from a particular orientation and then there's a way of getting as much of the best of both worlds as we possibly can do. Again, I just think that because you start with an orientation and things change too quickly before you get to the perfect yeah. bended curve, you're just, you just have to deal with the fact that whatever, or like you're going to end up getting a little more of the costs and benefits of the orientation than the optimal would suggest because it's just, you, oh, you're, you started with the, with, so let me, let me give you There's example. reasons why maybe Ember wasn't like, didn't, uh, experiment as much as it could have that aren't related to the commitment to stability. Yes, I, exa um, exactly, exactly. And, yeah, and, and but part of so. But the, but but e even still, like the point is that the number one val like the there is a there was a like a there's a non sacrificeable. Yeah, there is like there is like a decision that this thing is like the most important thing, and so even if those things are like incidental and can be improved, like the rate of innovation can increase without sacrificing in this dimension. It's still true that by choosing this dimension to focus on that. That is about and that's what attracts yes, people to yes, ember yes, and that's exactly. good yes. and, and, and I, I think what i'm trying to say is there's a difference between saying we are not willing to sacrifice something which is in our case we're not willing to sacrifice bringing people together right. along there's a difference between that and saying we are on the most extreme side of that axis, yeah 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 right yes, sure I think sure basically sure. what i'm talking about is actually pretty close to the middle of the axis where, sure, you, sure, where you actually sure. start hitting the sacrifice ability thing you so, wouldn't have a values conflict with someone who wanted to come and had an experimental idea um, that was like uh, going to and like, in fact, take exists. away if, in, so, in a small way. You wouldn't be like, nope, it's like, no, it's, it's, know, I, there's zero experiments. So or that was true in 1X, but in, in now, it's even much more extreme than that. Mm -hmm. When we originally announced the component, the new component API, we actually just shipped a thing called component manager, which is mm -hmm. just in a, a primitive, right? When we do, I want to talk more about that, but when we do testing, we, there's just an internal API. We happen to maintain the Mocha and QUnit ones, but people can do whatever they want. And things like that actually allow Mirage to even exist in the Ember community. There's, I think, a reason why it was there first. Um, so yeah. what, what is actually true is that today, in 2020, we're, we are actually quite biased towards the experiment side. Um, modif we don't even have built-in modifiers, which are a feature of Ember at all right now. The only way to use modifiers is community add-ons. Right. The only except for a few built-in ones. The only difference is that we don't shout from the rooftops what, that people should use those things. So basically, one way to think, think about hooks, imagine so a lot of people say, oh, hooks are not really the end game. The real end game is a bunch of abstractions built on top of hooks. And at, at the end of the day, React users won't have to deal with all the problems that could come up that you've talked about in the podcast. Because at the end of the day, we're going to be using, saying use remote data. And like people like Ken C. Dodds are going to build it. Fine, that's good. The question is, how do we get from here to there? The Ember way is basically to be, is to like really allow people in the community to build 
you get release hooks as a thing that you explicitly say is primitive and not designed for app developers. Yeah. And then you say, okay, add-on authors, please build stuff. Yeah. And then eventually you expose the public API as something that you can all use together. In the meantime, the add-on ecosystem is doing yeah. some of the work. The React approach is to say, we actually have no idea whether that's true or not. The fastest way, which is true, is to just give hooks now to all React users and just let the community work it out. There's not, that's a totally a, um, is a fastest, serviceable. But there's, there's also a cost. That's to a totally accept, acceptable thing. But I think the point is you can see hooks going exactly the same way as the, as the Octane story. It's not a technical issue. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. Yep, right. yep. And I think, I think just our orientation fundamentally is, yeah, it's, we, a, uh, it's it, not about whether experiments are possible or not. It's who are you foisting the costs onto. Yeah, yep. No, that's a, I, I, um, I've been thinking about this because, again, having done Ember for so long and then using React, um, it does feel like uh, certainly like um, it's not like the last UI framework, which is what people have like talked about, but not even that. I don't think anyone in the core team would even say that because we're, it's like a different, it's like a different it layer of It makes no sense to say that abstraction. I think hooks defeated that well, thought it, pattern. But it's also just a way to think about like, um, really it, 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 is, it is much lower level, which is why it is so programming heavy, which is like what we talked about in the last time. And which is why like the orientation is, is, um, is quite different from tools that, like, that, are, that are higher level. Um, it's like almost the difference between like AWS services and like these things that are built on top that are meant yes. to like make it accessible. So, um, but again, I think it's, there's a thing that we can't yell loud enough and it causes people to think that, to think that there's a more extreme thing going on. We, every single feature that we have shipped for the past like 18 months has started with a thing that is as primitive as hooks mm -hmm. and not, and it's not just that that's true. We also either ourselves on the core team or through the add on ecosystem built the higher level abstractions in user space and iterated on them. Right. So there's like, we actually have a version of the react story. It's just that we, the way we the, yes, exactly. yeah. the way we communicate yeah. it is to say 80% of our users shouldn't be dealing with this. 80% yeah. of our users should be doing the same thing. And react wants to say that. They, they say, don't, you don't need to use hooks right now. Hooks are experimental, but they're not really saying it, right? Like, I think at some point you have to decide what your orientation is. And as much as React wants to say that, it, it would be bad for their community if they did. If they said, please don't experiment with this, that would actually be against the orientation of the React ecosystem. So they can't do that and, don't, and shouldn't. I'm not saying they should do it. I'm saying sure, they shouldn't sure, do sure. it. Sure, sure, sure. They just, they, they, yeah, it's clear that they they also want to service the higher level needs, yes. right? And but they, the focus is all, is the lower like level needs. Just like it would be needs. wrong yeah. for the Ember ecosystem for us to say to proselytize the component manager for us API. To say, Go, every uh, every developer uh, uh, use component manager. Yeah, yeah. Right. I think it's like those are, but that but that is not the same thing as saying in the Ember as Evan said in the Ember community there's no experimentation and the React community is experimentation run wild. That's like wrong. That is a, that is not the right conclusion in either place. And I, and I think what's like, it's important that we're all, the reason I'm saying like there's an optimal but, answer is it's important that we're all trying. Yeah, I will say just to kind of like challenge that, I guess a little bit, um, even if it's not, is it, you said it's not true in Ember, um, but what makes it true? Like maybe the emphasis is actually the most important part regardless of those primitives I think, exist. I think where the rubber meets the road about whether it's true or not is whether Ember modifiers as a library actually exists, right? So, um, because the modifier manager API came out, curly curly on existed in the ecosystem and right. people used it. And again, it's important that 10% of users use it. Yeah. It's important that people who are willing to put up, to opt in to being the Vanguard are able to opt into being the Vanguard. And it's that, this is just a very hard tuning problem. It's like yeah. what I've been doing this for yeah. 10 years now or nine, whatever. That is the hard tuning problem is how to let, and it's, we started at the, at the place where Evan says we're on the far end where we're not giving a lot of space for the 10% because our orientation is it's dangerous. Dangerous is the wrong word. It's, we really want to bring people together. Now, yeah, you again, value that more so much that you're not willing to. And what we keep doing is iterating further and further, like, okay, did, did the number get beyond 10%? Mm -hmm. it's, and not that we're looking at that, but like, does it look like every, how many people are confused? How many people think that they're supposed to use Component Manager? Oh, the number is still quite small. Okay, that means we didn't actually reach the limits of what experimentation. Whereas from the React perspective, if the answer was only 5% of the users were using hooks, that would seem like a failure. For sure, yeah. Right? yeah. I think that, that difference matters. Yeah, yeah. And in a way that is not... No, it's an I'm interesting not, way to... to it's, a, it's a good way to, to... That I don't think anyone would disagree with, that to, to classify right. the... Um, and I think what that might cause people to think, even though it is not 
true. Like this is what I'm saying is not true. Is well, well maybe you're just saying that there could, the Ember community could do a better job of uh, describing and marketing the experimental doing. pieces without, without while being clear that this is not doesn't mean that and I think app still, developers have to understand this. We still have headroom there. Um, I what I th the thing I think is like wrong, and I wish people would think less is. Oh, re like React landed ES6 classes like three years before Ember, right? I think we land, like React landed it, I think three to six months later, there was an equivalently experimental version inside of Ember. And like, I think three to six months after React said, everybody use ES6 classes, which was like three to six months before they said, never, no more classes. Um, we landed native class support, right? But like that difference matters, right? There's like a bunch of people trying to use ES6 classes while the React core team is slowly coming to the conclusion that we're not using classes anymore. If that had happened to Ember, it wouldn't have affected anyone. Right, and we, nobody would, like 90% of our users would never have tried to use ES6 classes in the first place. So then we yeah. would have been like, oh, it turns out hooks, and then we would do the same process again. Yeah, yeah. Right, and I think like that makes people think that we're, Ember is like, it's, it's true that Ember is three or six months behind, but we are not multiple years behind generally. Yeah. Right. Interesting. Um, very interesting. Okay, so kind of bringing it back to what we started this conversation with, um, I mean, you know, your blog posts ha have been out you talk about getting into rails and some of these um you know i thought it was interesting some of the conversation about feeling like you were uh like value opposed to dhh and you realized you weren't um thought that was an interesting point and also it was I so striking at the time it was, it was like i i really went from feeling like this per I don't want to say enemy because I don't really feel like I ever, but like there sure. is, this is like totally the yeah, opposite. Yeah, I have nothing in common with this, but we have it. We're on completely yes. two different yes. planes. Literally like, a month later, it's like, let's work on this thing together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's like good. that was just a striking. That is, that, so everyone should read that, I think, and, and who's interested in this. And also the other part that I thought was interesting and relevant to what we're talking about was, um, you know, just how you felt coming into programming and how Rails made you feel like, um, yeah, like you I weren't left behind. Thing. You weren't alone, right? Tying it back to some of this, that, that, that part that's important to you. So I think there's a nice thread here between your story of getting into programming, how you think about this stuff and your experience and um, everything we just talked about, which is like what does Ember place an emphasis on? And yeah. so... Um, yeah, unfortunately, like, so this is good and... I, th I think in general, because loneliness is such a real issue and loneliness like affects people's sense of self-worth. And like, if you want to look at imposter syndrome, like that's caused by the same, like it's made worse by these factors. Um, so I think it's good that we do that. I think one of the things that I realized when I started really thinking about this more is that online communities only go so far. Um, and really what, if you ask someone who studies the loneliness epidemic, they'll tell you people need to come together in person that people it makes a big difference between someone who never who, i there's i go to a thing called music together um with uh leah and jonas every week it's just a it's a class it's like eight to ten parents and their kids under five years old and it's a bunch it's a ev there's a bunch of franchises across the country everybody sings the same songs every week um and it's it rotates throughout a two or three year cycle, what songs there are, and they, 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 you know, they rotate through the semester and across the semesters. And um, I noticed once I started going, it's like a 45 minute thing. I don't even talk to anybody really. It's just, it's music. Um, how much of a big difference it made to my like sense of well being and community. Um, I, don't, I don't have a church or anything um, or a synagogue as I had when I was growing up. And so it makes a big difference like even a little bit, if you, if you have nothing. Um, the, the community I grew up in had a saying, a little light dispels a lot of darkness. And th when you really have no community, when you're totally alone, when you're living in, uh, there's a movie Zootopia, which shows the, it's a really good movie. Um, the rabbit goes to the big metropolis and she like goes into her um, little apartment building and like really has no human contact outside of work. Um, there's a- Yeah, I mean, I can absolutely relate to that. New York City is, um, they talk a lot about that kind of thing there, um, crowded loneliness, yes. you know, where it's like there's people everywhere. But uh, yeah, if you just got out of a relationship, if you are not in a living, good living situation, um, if you're Nobody's not... forcing you to talk to anybody. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. Despite there being so many people. It's like being malnourished 
and obese at the same time. Yeah. Right? Yep. It's like a surprising phenomenon, but somehow the modern world it makes happens. it happen. Yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, so, so that, like, that made me realize, like, as much as an online community can go far, like a little bit of mm -hmm. offline support matters a lot. And which is why I'm so bummed that Emmerconf and like this freaking virus, because like seriously, yes, I, no. have, I have so much fun every year. Like um, regardless of what's going on, going on on my life, like honestly, the people in the Emmer community are some of my favorite people. And like, I just, we, I always leave this conference like beaming. Feeling better. Yeah. And so. Um, I mean, I think it's the thing that sucks the most about social distancing. We have, we literally are in a country where <laughs> there's an there is a loneliness epidemic. Now there's a pandemic. Now we have, that the has pandemic the opposite. The, yes, the, exactly. The, the symptom is the worst. The pandemic worsening. beats. Yeah. <laughs> the loneliness epidemic, but the <laughs> pandemic is actually worsening the loneliness epidemic. And right, like, we got to right. do what we got to do. But right. I think um, Ezra Klein wrote a really, uh, you should put this in the show notes, a really good article that something like the coronavirus will cause a loneliness, make the loneliness epidemic worse or something like that. And like, by the way, the people most susceptible to the loneliness epidemic are people who are Coming elder, elderly, elderly, oh, 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 oh. because at some point oh, you lose access to your yeah. like relationships. Shoot. I feel like that. And I'm like in my thirties. <laughs> yes. So now you have people, I'm not meeting new people anymore. Now you have people where the <laughs> pandemic is like, you must not talk to anybody. Oh, geez. Yeah. And that the loneliness epidemic is like, the solution is come together more. Yeah. Right. So we, that's a, this is a real issue that yeah. because hopefully I'm, doesn't last. Uh, yes, a I, long I, time. I can't get. I think the only, the thing I would say about that is because these things are at cross purposes. To the extent that we can still slow the spread of the pandemic, like call up your grandparents yeah. on yeah. Zoom, no, that's good. like go knock on people's doors and like don't have to touch them, but you can like check to make sure everything's fine, yeah. right? So b basically, this like uh, I want to get to what we're doing about it. So um, a little bit of in-person goes a long way. And so I, I, the first thing I thought was, oh, well, we have a solution to that. It's called meetups. And like, not only are, do we have meetups, but like we did this awesome thing where every meetup gets its own Tomster and like this is awesome um, sense of community building. But unfortunately, like the Ember meetup um, ecosystem has been stagnating a lot. And so I'm like, unfortunately, the answer is not just tell people to go to meetups more because it's just there aren't as many meetups as there once were. And in general, it's like many people don't have access to them, et cetera. Um, so I, but, but I said, okay, given the severity of the problem, um, I like, let, let me put some thought into how we can cause, like make meetups a better answer for people. Like if there's no meetup in some city now, and there used to be a meetup before, like, why is that? And how can we fix it? So I, I actually tweeted, you may have seen this and reached out to people to say like, can you tell me a little bit about like, number one, what made your meetup rewarding when you were able to run it or if you still are. And number two, like what made it hard? Um, and I got a lot of good answers and I should like eventually collate them into a blog post or something. But almost everybody said what made it rewarding was that they felt like they were part of the Ember community. They were giving back. They felt like they were building a local community. People cared. They were able to um, bring, like, bring joy, make people happy, right? Uh, they, they were able to mentor people. Um, and the thing that many people said was a struggle was uh, number one, keeping meetup attendance up, which uh, we'll talk about. But number two is like getting getting enough content so that the meetup can meet on a regular basis. Um, actually, very few people said like pizza is the problem. It turns out that like getting a local company to sponsor pizza for a year is not super hard. Um, some people said paying meetup.com dues was a problem, but first of all, mostly only. Um, when they were already struggling. So like that was the straw that broke the camel's back. Should I really renew? Eh. Um, but also like it might suggest that like meetup.com is like the worst meetup.com. If people are literally canceling, canceling meetups because they're like, I can't afford the fee. Like yeah. that is some, they should like- They're see, not aligned. They should search inside, inside of their soul are, are to see what's aligned. happening here. Um, so yeah, so, so, so that's what happened. And um, so the content thing like really stood out to me as a thing that really matters and and also something we could do something about mm -hmm. so so in particular we really like the, we need to get make people have an excuse to go to the meetup right, right? and if, if there's no content there's no reason to go um, so uh, and and also like we want to reduce the effort that it takes for someone to decide like when to meet and stuff like that so the the roughly the plan which we're going to talk about at in the keynote that has already happened mm -hmm time travel um, is we're going to we're going to reactivate the Portland meetup, which has not happened in a while because of me having a kid. Um, 
But we have a, I, you can take a picture of that. We have a big area, which is basically the kids play area because we do a babies at work program here. And I think we're going to try to make the meetup here something where you can bring your kids. Um, and like, like, so they'll play in the play area and like we'll do stuff in the main area. I think like I'm really, it's related to all this, right? I think like commute, like there's, it's not a coincidence that like many, many people don't have, like religion is like dropping like a stone and also people are, don't feel like they have community. Mm -hmm. Like I, I'm not saying the solution is everybody go to church, but I'm yeah. saying it's not a coincidence. Yeah, yeah, um, sure. So sure. we're gonna restart the Portland meetup um, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna live stream and also um, pre-record record the Portland meetup, like a 30 minute welcome announcement for people. Um, so anyone who's like in approximately the right time zone can just like plan to meet at the same time as the Portland meetup. Um, people can like show up just to watch the 30 minute video and okay now I gave you an excuse to show up <laughs> um, and after that I think we'll like if people want if people want to have local content great like no, nothing's stopping you from doing that um, if people don't have local content that's fine also um, options that I think we'll I'm gonna write a little handbook about this but options could be like just do a project night um, like let people network, uh, let people just like do demos of things, right? I think people who have run meetups for a while kind of know yeah. what the story is. I think part of it is like not everyone knows all the things. So, uh, and I think part of what I'm hoping to do to incentivize the things like the project night is like try to schedule them regularly or like at make them sometimes attached to the, the Portland meetup plan and then say something like if like every meetup please like send your favorite project to us and we'll write a blog post about it right so that's that's interesting a way. i thought you were i thought the direction you were going was maybe like they if they don't have local content they can watch the live stream that, in I, think that's, I think that's also that's also good i think in general because like that would be um i there's been times like in new york i've been busy or whatever something's going on and I, I want to see those people, but maybe like the meetup doesn't happen for some reason. Um, maybe the organizers like out of town, yep. you know, maybe like Luke moved to freaking Cambodia or something, wherever he is. And, uh, you know, we're taking some time to get it together. But if there was like some coordination and um, I could still get together with Spencer and Ryan and Matt and like all those people and we just could tune into the live yes. stream. I think the MVP of this thing is I think that, everyone would really like that. Yes, I think the MVP is that I think part of why I'm wanting to do project nights or something more is i think the point of this is for people to actually talk to each other sure, so like sure. i think we should but i, I think you're right I, I think, think there can be a thing where you like watch it and then like you do the and then we do the project. discuss it, exactly. and stuff like that the plan is to basically have like a table of contents that has some shared parts and some like local parts and like give people a template for it so so there's that and i there's one other thing i want to say about this which is because there will be a live stream that also means that people who are not able to um, meet up in person can get on the virtual it turns out that the virtual EmberConf like forced the issue on building some of this infrastructure, which was a convenient thing. Yeah, um, but necessity is yes. another of innovation. So people can like this was already the plan before coronavirus. So like I probably don't get as much credit for thinking of it now. But um, the idea is that people can still meet up. If people can still log in, they'll be on the Discord channel. People can watch the stream. And what I'm hoping is not just that there's these two islands, but that watching the stream like will provoke people to want to create more local meetups or meet up more in person like oh that looks fun um l let's put coronavirus aside for whether people should be creating large gatherings right now but like yeah. hopefully that will be over at some yeah. point um and also like people can like i think a totally good middle ground is like oh there's like three people in an office that can go watch it in the conference room right so yeah. like the idea Absolutely. is just provoke more in-person meeting and like that's no even ryan and me do that um uh when like a conference is going on and or even an apple event like thoughtbot had mm -hmm. watch watch events watch where parties. you could go watch parties for apple uh keynotes yeah um super fun yeah so like i think um, in general all of this comes from the core axiom of like we should help people meet up more together in person we should help people make more yeah. local connections and you could think of the meetup thing as oh that's a cool idea i'm glad the ember community. it's like just like octane there's like a lot more going on under the surface and i think it is a cool idea but like I Ember really like going forward in the next like let's say we're still around for 10 more years mm -hmm. we, we said like we're gonna be around for 10 years we're closing in on that I'm not ready I'm not done yet yeah. um, like the community didn't DHH one said like what's next well like one thing that could happen is everyone copies rails like actually that didn't happen yeah. um, and like I'm sort of in the same place like if everyone absorbed the things that were good about Ember I don't need we don't need to be here, yeah. but that hasn't happened. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so like if we're going to like, if in, for, for the next decade, like we're just starting 2020. So like for the 2020s, I think my personal mission is to use Ember as a vehicle for 
it's bringing people together both online and in person um, i think it really is important that like not everyone can meet in person and some of the people who have the the worst problem like the most um, acute versions of loneliness are people who can't they're for yeah. some reason they're literally unable i think i think for that for that kind of situation the online community really helps so i think well, we yeah. shouldn't we shouldn't pretend that that's not true yeah but that it doesn't help alleviate so it's, yeah i've heard people situations say that. certain personality types certain people yep. um it solves it solves a real yep. need for, and, for and lots of people actually, actually actually studies show that um a little bit of in-person contact like once or twice a year so like studies show that if you um are friends with someone in college after like two or three years they go from like being your close buddy to like you basically never think about yeah. them they're like a person you text once in a while um and but the inverse of that is a little bit of like once or twice a year of meeting with someone and i think people can yeah. like think about it yourself you'll realize that that's true like people who you occasionally meet like us yeah. have a closer relationship than people who you literally never yeah. meet so, no matter how much like th i think there's a certain amount there's some people who like you have such an intense online relationship with that somehow it works but it's a pretty like maybe everyone has one person like that right i think um, so, so basically, yeah, the in-person is a game changer. The in-person no matters. It. And so like that also means that even if there's a person who's like mostly tuning in to the virtual meetup, but maybe like comes to EmberConf and like once or twice a year drives to their local meetup, if we make that work, I think that that matters a lot. So like the, the trend, the, the spectrum between being a hundred percent virtual attendee and feeling like you're part of the virtual community to like two people in an office, you're like hanging out with your neighbor all the way to like you're actually coming all the time or hanging out with people in person is like important spectrum because they can't it's hard to jump the chasm yeah like it's, yep so anyway that's the, that's the plan cool i also want to kind of like just ask and like because I, I know it's true but i want to i want to ask it like um octane was a really great technical achievement the model is something that everyone's really happy with um yeah we didn't talk about we didn't that. even talk about it but just to kind of and maybe we still can um but just to kind of put to wrap on this point like the while this everything we've talked about is clearly like a uh, one driving force for what your work is doing is inspiring like the, the strategy over the next year and five years whatever you still care about ember adoption and you you think that this is an important part of it yes um like uh I think that this is a feature. You, you, you still, you, 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 it's not just that this is an important aspect of Ember, but, um, you know, you've talked a lot in the last like year, or I would say about meeting web developers where they're at in terms yeah, of what technology good. they know and why you think in the same way that these aspects of Ember haven't been absorbed by the larger JavaScript ecosystem or front end ecosystem. So to have certain other the other technical aspects of ember haven't been and you still believe in them and still believe that people um can stand to benefit a lot from ember from octane and from using the tools that the ecosystem has provided so it's not just about alleviating loneliness right the, the, it doesn't work if, if the, there's not if it's not useful yeah exactly so just because we've been kind of speaking in the abstract for so long um like I, but i think that i think even the concrete has a flavor of the abstract right so um that was a pretty abstract thing to say so. Yeah, <laughs> go ahead. I feel like as I get older <laughs> and older, like things time. that people said, like <laughs> things that like the Buddha said, like start making more sense. To okay, me. I think it's like a thing that happens to everyone. Okay, um, but uh, right. So uh, the what concrete, I, the, the what yeah. I mean, what I mean by that is like teams benefiting from Octane. So a, like a big part of what happened in Octane is that we went from the component model being extremely like you can't really use it without writing some javascript code in any meaningful way um, we went from that to an html first model and uh importantly i don't mean we used to have jsx and now we went to templates like everyone knows we had templates but before there was the part of your component that is written in html and it like really we worked hard over the years to like make that part more and more there's a real html parser like it's a more or less compliant html parser that is part of the system. We have a, re a compliant, more or less, tree builder. I say more or less because, like, even in HTML, the template tag is like weird, and so like for similar reasons, there's some weirdness. We don't support MathML yet, maybe. Um, so, for all so, intents and purposes, yeah. I think the those caveats 
are are not important to the aspiration. The aspiration is we're like using the real algorithm that people use to build the tree to parse the syntax, right? In, like not not a kind of not a regex version, but like I wrote an HTML tokenizer that you can like also use for other purposes, right? So um, we've always done that. That's like the first version of of Glimmer was called HTML bars because the goal was to like not have to write bind adder and because I you should just like write the HTML that looks like HTML. So that that has always been a thing, but for the long basically until Octane, you still had to like the there was a root element that like and your click handlers were in the class and you have to write things like class name bindings or attribute bindings. And like frankly, that was the worst part of Ember in a lot of ways. I like I I personally didn't like it. Um, Every time I started, I want to write a thing about Ember for beginners. That's like the thing that made me stop. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I don't mean beginner Ember. I mean like people who know HTML, like what I was in 2005. I know HTML and CSS. I want a little bit of dynamic. How do I do it, right? Um, when you're learning PHP or Rails, you literally take the HTML that you were writing before, you Super put it set. into the new context. Yeah. It so far worked, yeah, and then yeah, you made yeah. it dynamic. Yeah. Uh, Ember for the longest time can't, couldn't do that. Um, not, not really. Um, I think there's a way in which that exact thing works, but you hit a lot of roadblocks if you start try to really keep going as a as a designer, which is what I, I was when I started. And again, the class name binding, attribute bindings thing, the actions hash, um, having like having click handlers have to use action or be in line in the JavaScript. Like these are all little things that add up to you can't really like be a designer have a bunch of HTML that you already wrote with CSS and then like start breaking it up into components in Ember and writing the little dynamic stuff, right? And um, what Octane basically did, and it, this is kind of taking a page from React, but also React is JSX, so it doesn't, it's like a little, it's a weird page, um, is we basically said that an Ember component doesn't have an outer element anymore. There's no, there's no um, JavaScript controlled element that's like invisible to your HTML. Everything that's in the different from every other element that, that you are yeah. writing. So Angular still does what Ember did. I think it was kind of, it's the web component model. It's kind of like what people assumed. I think for me it was eye opening to see that React was like, oh, a component is just a it's just an abstraction. It's just a, it's just in your code. It's nothing. It disappears. It, it, it disappears. It gets called and returns an element. It's all elements, yes. basically. It's it's just an abstraction. Just like a function doesn't like appear in the output of your right. code, a uh, component doesn't appear in the output. That was that's like a different way of thinking. It's yeah, different than how definitely. Web thinking. No, right? it's, and, it's yeah. And that was like a huge revelation. I I remember I um, how angle brackets components came about in the first place is that there was a, there's a thing called thinking in React. I was sitting when Tom still worked at Tilda. We were at LinkedIn and I was going through and I said, I'm going to port this to Ember. And I started doing it. And I just eventually hit a point where the class name bindings was making it impossible because really what that thing did was it broke apart your HTML into smaller pieces and then did the data flow. And it just didn't work. Okay? I couldn't do it. And that's, that's actually, I, by the, we only now landed it in a way that I feel like great about hundred percent of Ember users using it. That's, it, that's the whole, that yeah. I have to like build two versions of Glimmer. <laughs> Right, but like what that basically like that that that's a thing that React I think invented. Um, it's I think an underappreciated aspect of what React did. I think some React people know and talk about it, but broadly I think people don't see what the difference the, between the models is. And Ember just decided like that day with Tom at LinkedIn. Um, I, it's worth working we towards. We decided that that's, that's every the plan. step there's like a, the lowest. What's the lowest barrier to every single yeah. step? And it took a lot of time, I think, because like whatever. We that's a blog post for another time. But it took it took time to get there. But what Octane basically says is, um, I th I think I said HTML is HTML was the first the title of the first section. I don't know. I don't think that's how we kept it. But um, I, we rewrote the whole docs, the whole guides, by the way. I, I did most of the work on the component guide, guide rewrite myself. Um, and really, like, what I tried to do with the new guides was see how far I can get before I have to introduce JavaScript at all. And it actually turns out to be quite far. Um, so, like, arguments, you can pass an argument from a component to another component and never touch JavaScript, right? You can yield and never touch JavaScript. You can set up... Um, I think event handlers, you can do a lot of work with event handlers. The amount of JavaScript that you need is like really pretty tightly scoped to what you might have done in jQuery, right? right? So there's basically all these, um, we, what we basically did in Octane is say, like, let's, let's see what, how far we can get with HTML. So, because like really how I wish it worked, this is like different from how 
JSX thinks about the world. How I wish that worked is kind of like how jQuery worked. So you start with HTML, and then sometimes you need behavior, so that's when you make JavaScript. It's hanging off on the side. It's not that important. Yeah. Um, and like that's the model that Octane has. It's yeah. it's like kind of um, because we work so hard on making it like a gradual adoption path, and not we don't want to. It's like the Obama stimulus efforts where he's like, I'm gonna make everyone spend money by not telling them that they have more money. Like, no, that, do, that doesn't really work in that case. And maybe, maybe we're screwed also. But we, we don't, we, there's actually a real issue with us that shouting from the rooftops about all the details of all the changes because it causes a lot of confusion about what the plan is. So we focus more on like, this is the new model, it's great. And, and we don't always talk in great detail outside of blog posts or RFCs about like philosophically what we're trying to do. But in this case, what we are trying to do is, may, is see what an HTML first framework actually is about. Like, how can you, and, and now, and like, this is a good, the future of Ember, like, we don't, we didn't do this before. This is new. So like, the, I, we have a, we have some headroom now to like, reach out to people who I was are in 2005. Yeah, people and are like, comfortable with, uh, and maybe feel intimidated yes. by the JavaScript heavy landscape. And like, I think what's like really awesome about it is for the first time for Ember, you could generate a new app. Let's say you're a designer who has some HTML and CSS. You can generate a new app. You can, you can take your HTML and CSS, you can paste it in, you can use Ember CLI deploy to like push it to Netlify, and now you have it, it's on the internet. You can like share it with your friend. You never wrote a line of JavaScript. I'm not saying JavaScript is bad, I'm just saying, in, the, in my view, the way, like, and my It's empowering to this kind of front-end developer. If you have something on the internet that you could share with your friends, and now you're like, like, how did I learn anything? I, I said, oh, I need a form, and then I said, this sucks, the form is too long. I, on, I only want to, I was writing a golf, uh, a, a golf event for a, a nonprofit, and I said, I don't want to have to show you all the golf clubs that you can have. Like, why don't I only show you the ones that actually matter to you? How, how do I do that? Well, uh, the, I already had a working system that I could have shipped to production if I wanted, but let me like learn enough JavaScript to make that work. And I, I remember, uh, why do people make you type city, state, and zip? Like, the zip code is actually enough information, right? Yeah. But that, but how do you do that? Yeah, yeah. Right. So, but like, it is important that like people can make a portfolio in PHP without writing PHP. Yeah, yeah. You want you want it's so much easier to learn anything. But like in this case, the JavaScript for how to make a request with a zip code and auto populate the city and state when you are a motivated person by that use case and that's a need that you have because you're like focused on that as opposed to I want to put my HTML and CSS on the internet. And now, like, let me like, learn JSX. Yeah, let, let me learn. Let me learn JavaScript stuff. That's There's like, wrong with I, I don't understand it. Right. It's just I don't. Yeah. It's. I think it's less about. It's it less would be like it's like why I haven't done like serverless stuff yet because like I haven't had a pain point yet. I think I think you're saying a thing that people say and it's true, but I want. I think what's actually happening is having a working system that already does anything for you, anything at all, and the your the iter It's not that you didn't need it yet. Like I think you technically could need it or someone could argue at that point. Yeah, you'd be better like off with you it. Have to, you have to encounter, the, the, you have to have a thing that already works and then, the, oh, I just have to do a little serverless. Yeah, exactly. You, nobody, that's not how serverless works, right? But maybe it's like, I think yeah. it could be how Ember works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so that's like an exciting, exciting future direction. That's pretty interesting, man. I really hadn't heard that yet. I mean, I knew, I knew that obviously the guides were focused on basically like how long can we stay in template land. Um, but it's definitely like a different, that's like a stake in the ground that's uh, different than a lot of the other frameworks. And I think um, there's I something actually, to that. I want to say something to the people who are thinking isn't Vue that. I think uh, what I think is interesting about Ember. So Vue thinks about itself as being for beginners. But what it means by beginner is a person who already has a backend of some sort, like Laravel or Rails. And they don't have enough, they can't learn a whole new system like ember or react and like because as you probably know like putting an ember app inside of laravel is like pretty hard so view is like no problem even though you're like don't really know a lot about the front end yet there's like a little on ramp for you and i think that's great i think that actually is serves that, a need that yeah. is a real that is a, a true need. low on ramp expand the empowerment um footprint thing but there is another user who does not already have laravel mm -hmm. who does not already have rails and for whom the fact that Vue does not give you, does not have an ecosystem built around building a whole app is actually an issue, right? In, in other words, it's and I don't want to be clear. I'm not saying you cannot do that with Vue. I'm saying who is it, this thing empowering, right? So Vue really does empower the Laravel developer or the Rails developer 
which is a lot or PHP developer who already has an HTML page and wants to add an app. I think there's a, just another kind of user who only knows, who doesn't, doesn't know the backend language. Yeah. And, um, I think Mirage is actually an important part of this. Like you could build out your application without really building your backend. I, I actually am really for like a couple of years now, I think Airtable is underappreciated here. Like people might not know this, but if you build an Airtable database, first of all, it looks like Excel. And as everyone always says, everyone knows Excel, <laughs> but second of all, it gives you a version of the API docs that is like localized for the tables that you made. So it, let's say you make a table that's like mm. all the, um, the docs themselves will tell you how to like query yes, the, the user's the table that thing. you made. You make like, here's the schedule for EmberConf. Here's all the sessions. The docs actually show you, this is the curl. This is the JavaScript API. It is very cool. And I really think there's a, there's like a game changer opportunity, which I think like Airtable did already. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to live. I'm going to sit with that. Um, there's a game changing opportunity for the back. I know you like Hasura, but I think there's like that. There's a kind of person who, who is a Hasura user. And there's a kind of person who knows how to use spreadsheets like Leia, even she's now learning programming, but for the longest time she maintained the EmberConf website, the tilde website. And those are actually data oriented websites. When we add a new employee, like there is a data that has like the employee in their picture. And like, she actually, you know, she used the terminal and GitHub and edited the YAML file that has that data in it. Right. So there's a kind of person who's like a good Excel user and is not turned off by a little bit of programming who I think Airtable is really good for. Like yeah. basically in, in 2020, if I was, you know, I built those data oriented systems in 2000, in 2012 or 13 or 14, whatever. In 2020, I think Fire, I used to think Firebase was this, but I think for various reasons it isn't, um, including the fact that the documentation really needs to be good. So in, in 2020, I think I would just say, oh, there's an employees table in, in Airtable and we're gonna fetch it. I also, I also think that some people say, oh, you're talking my language. This is why GraphQL is so important. I actually think that if you are in control of your backend, if you're using Airtable, like GraphQL actually isn't that important. Like it's not, um, the reason that people think they care a lot about it is, be, is often because they don't control the backend. There's another backend team that's like super, um, annoying to work with. They can't, and I, people talk about this. This is like the motivating use case. Like I can't convince them they're like adding a new field takes like six months. Now we're using GraphQL. It's awesome. Um, I think, I just think there's a, like, I think that's a transport. It's like, it would imagine if in like 2005, people were like, I am so excited. I get to use HTTP. Like that would have been a weird thing to say. I think GraphQL is serving an important purpose. I'm not against it. I think like Skylight recently added support for GraphQL. I think people in Ember, in the Ember ecosystem who are using GraphQL backends should like use Ember Apollo. I'm, I'm not against it. I just think it's a weird thing to focus your energy on as like, this is the defining thing. It's like a very programming, a very <clears throat> well, paradigm-y it, way it, of thinking it, it, about it. It is, but in the same way that Hooks is both lower level, but um, is market, since it's marketed to yeah. app developers, if the app developer has an appetite for it and they learn it, they feel empowered. And it's the same, it's a similar thing here. I guess here's what I would say. I think Airtable is the key thing. Right now, Airtable has a REST it's API. It's certainly if, more. If um, they have a GraphQL API, great, people can use it. But the Airtable was the interesting thing in the first place. Sure. No, 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 this is why you're working on Ember and not the API for like, improving actually, the API for component manager because so it goes back to what we're talking about. I did work on JSON API and I think this is like, this for me is the reason that I think it's, I still think it's very important to have a REST oriented alternative to GraphQL. I think that's a good project. But, but JSON API was an end game. Yes. The end game was the, the active record. Yes. And, like, and increasingly yeah. I'm just, I just think the whole ecosystem is focusing too much on like, like imagine TCP versus UDP, like those things matter. They really matter. Like the TCP is much better than UDP, but like, I, I, again, I, I want to give credit. We're just talking about different art. I think audiences. GraphQL matters a lot because it's like a paradigm shift in how organizations are run. Like, I think the fact that people who are, who could spend six months trying to get one field added now can have total control over the back end. Yeah, they can draw a boundary around all that stuff in the front I end. I think team that's very, very powerful. Moving. Yeah. It's very yeah. important. Um, I also think that giving like a new developer, a new developer is not going to, they're not going to be as empowered as being able to use active record and a new rails app in 2005 right. and not have to learn the database and yep. and air the air table, um, JavaScript API actually does have an ORM in it, like as an example, and people can build ORMs again, GraphQL totally fine. But really what I'm trying to say is, um, between Mirage and Airtable, I think you can easily imagine somebody because, sorry, I, let, let me just 
repeat a little a little bit of context. So, um, I was saying they're 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 on ramp for yeah. There's a pat, the, the path. The on ramp for Vue is basically you already have a Laravel app, and there, but there's a lot of people who don't already have a Laravel app. Yeah. And there's a path there where somebody like Ember News uses Ember CLI deploy to push to Netlify or something like that. They use Mirage for a little bit to mm. to build out their data, mm -hmm. and then then they move to Airtable when they're ready. They're built. They're building the Ember conf website so they really do need the schedule to be dynamic right. it also isn't a jamstack app because like the schedule can change a lot and like maybe leia doesn't want to have to like use her laptop to keep building it all the time or whatever i'm not i don't want to get into that but um i think there are there yeah, ultimately are ultimately cases. it's going to be powered by runtime apis yes, there are use cases for dynamic information they come up a no lot. of course of course right so, so of course i actually think jamstack is in general if it works, when it works is a good answer to this whole story, but it doesn't always work. So anyway, um, being I able think to start, the Jamstack app can still talk to a real time uh, runtime API. It just doesn't work if you need routing but, to be part of it. Like basically, if you need a different page, like if every single schedule item has its own page, the route like Jamstack basically forces you to pre-create all those pages because there's no runtime router other than the HTML pages. Um, I mean, like if, if, if you don't do it, it's not quite gems. It's like, it's fine. I think Jamstack is like, it's one of these words like agile that like increasingly has less meaning as you try to make it do more things. Right. Yeah, I agree. It, um, I'm, I'm again, I, yeah, it's not really, there's a talk here. at EmberConf about the Ember power Jamstack and like Empress is a thing. Like, I think these are all good. Um, what I was, <laughs> what I was trying to say You're, is, yeah, yeah. The point is going back to like this one person making a whole app, yes. basically they make a story. An app, they deploy it. They yeah. like importantly share with your friend. You can yeah. like, yeah. you can like make your Le Leia for her um, a flat iron class made the a babies at work admin app, and for her first like that was her first project. Like people should be able to do that. And the back end was Air Airtable. No, the back it was a Sinatra app with like active record got like, you but but i watched her do that and i was like i can see people doing it like it makes sense yeah 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 right mm -hmm. and the back the, it could be an ember app with a back end zero table and there's actually a ton of people making stuff where like does this load in under four seconds in the emerging market you know, on a mobile phone that like has no cpu is like not the top consideration yeah. for that person who's actually making an admin app for themselves yeah 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 to totally right. totally so no i i am all on board with that and i definitely have a vision w where mirage can help here like okay. you could imagine whether it's hasura or let's just say as an air table you could imagine like a, a mirage air table layer where yes. you're basically as you're building your app and you start with like JavaScript um, events for your schedule thing and then you want them to be dynamic, you go over to Mirage, you define a schema and you and you just say, all right, now I have a new table or a model or whatever, uh, a resource that's yep. uh, as, as like an event or, or a talk, right? Yep. And then the way you're querying the data out of it be, be, uh, because like the transport layer does ultimately matter right now, um, is exactly how it would come from Airtable. So basically when you're done building that against the Mirage Airtable layer, like you can basically go, just turn on Airtable and I flip think a you, switch. I, think, I like, think there's a really cool story there. I think there. in a perfect world, you just flip a switch. I think yeah. it's even acceptable for like a relative beginner, like I was in 2005 to have to write some code yeah, yeah, around yeah. the fetch, but it's pretty, I think it's pretty minimal. Um, yeah, I mean, the I think, when I did it, when I was learning Hasura, it was it was pretty crazy. Yeah. And, and I think it's not unique to Hasura. That story is not unique to Hasura. It's yeah. just a, that, that idea. For what it's worth, I like I when I was playing with this idea a few months ago, I used Faker a lot in the like in the Mirage part. Yeah, yeah. And I thought I actually thought that story could be fleshed up. Not yeah, I mean, oh. Mirage is Mirage's job. I no, just, no, no. In terms of the what is the workflow? Oh, a hundred percent. It was great. A hundred percent. Faker was awesome. Yeah, but there's so much room. That, I mean, there's so much that could be done there. Like, I, I actually do think it makes sense for mirage to have like please generate a table yeah okay. yeah yeah yep but, but like for there's me there's so much I, there yeah like, i was just i think I it's was really building. the fake data scenarios and, and things like that especially with folks who have like really large mirage setups and have like completely data driven apps um the value really is in like the data scenarios that's yep. like such a big part of it i was building i think a stack overflow clone or something and it was like oh here's a paragraph here's a username whatever the, like and then it like looked like a real yeah, thing definitely. and i like made a button that was like add another like create another question in this list and yeah. it like worked obviously cool. so i think basically the bottom line is this there's a this story like makes sense i think it's actually i think it's an under you were asking about like the opening to new groups like myself in 2005 i think that yeah. particular user is underserved right now 
Um, and I think Ember is in a good, because Ember actually is the whole app story and like fun, like when, he, there's another aspect to this, which is when you join, like when you become a community member, mm -hmm. the fact that everybody else in Ember yeah. is doing the same thing. We're all using Ember CLI. We all know what Ember CLI deploy yeah. means. We yeah. all know what Ember Lightning strategy is. Um, we're like, it, we can like, basically Talk about Ember things, data, like, yeah. Like all, basically the fact that all of this is true, even Mirage, like is like a canonical part means that if that beginner talks to me, yeah. I actually can tell, like, not that I'll have time to answer everybody's questions, but I could answer a lot of their questions in a way that is, like, just not true about core team members of React, not because there's anything wrong with it, but their setup is just quite different than, like, yeah. the average person. And, and, like, there's no average person, right? There's everybody's own setups. So I, and, mm -hmm. like, that changes over time. So I think basically that aspect is underappreciated, the fact that the together part of Ember is a thing that really, really helps beginners. Now, unfortunately, I, I, I've been saying, if you look at the state of JS survey from 2019, we will see that we have very few beginners mm -hmm. in the community. And I think that's just a thing, like that's a room to grow situation right. where like basically beginners get the benefit of the experienced users a lot in number. That's like a really cool feature right, of a right, community. Right, right, right. I do think though that it is a good angle. And I, I've been, someone I've been following recently a lot is Guillermo Rauch from Yeah, he, I actually share a lot of values with Guillermo. Oh man. Uh, hundred percent and and he's all about this and and talking about like um you know the rails 15 minute demo and what that would look like today and you know it something... really needs to look like the same demo like but, saying oh things have gotten more complicated is really a cop out well that's but that's the thing but that's that the, they are because of the the glue layer is like missing or whatever yes, but that is called accidental complexity yeah missed all the react people who have learned those languages <laughs> but um you know his point was like you know rails built DHH built a blogging engine in 15 minutes. He, he built a blog engine that that has like the full capability. And then he spends like a few minutes on the front page for the actual blog page, right? And what he's saying is like these days, teams would rather like use like a headless CMS, um, WordPress or, or Contentful, yeah, I, I, which has all, is already the engine that's already built for you. And you could actually get you know, in five minutes, you could build a better front end that talks to Contentful. Which, um, or Airtable. I think Airtable yeah, fits or, into yeah, that Yeah, exactly. 100%, 100%. If you know those tools, right? And, and there's, there's still like, I was listening to that and I was like, yeah, that makes sense, but it's still cool that like you own the whole like stack or whatever. But like, it's just part of the world today is that that's what people and businesses want. They want to focus on the front end and the back ends um, can be shared you know, and and, yeah. and things like Airtable or Hasura or whatever your backend platform as a service is can serve like a lot of people's needs. I th so, I think but the, 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 so I think I think the no, I just wanted to say that I think the um, like it should be that's an interesting thing to explore. What is the five, ten, fifteen minute demo today end to end that is compelling and like show I me? I agree that that is a thing because people who talk about this and talk about this with like serverless stuff too, and it's like. But when you actually yeah. look if, at it, it's like, no, I'm not. You show if, me the AWS panel. I, you've yes, lost me confirm. already. If, That's it. If You're part done. of the story is make an AWS account, you already yeah. have failed. Which, again, the, another interesting folk, someone I'm following, Brian Ludo with begin.com. He's trying to do that, basically. He's trying like, to make that layer on lot, top of There's it. a lot of easy bake ovenness in a lot of these attempts. Like, yeah. I think that's even fine, like, as a teaching device, but. But the Ember, like, but I think there's a, a I think, I think between Ember staking a claim on the, the HTML first kind of thing, um, obviously HTML is like the language of the web. I mean, there's just no way around it. Yep. Um, I, I think and some a lot people, of people don't agree, but I no, think No, it is. Wrong. I mean, even if, even if, no, it is. I mean, how is it not? I feel like I mean, you, if you ask React people- React renders HTML. If you ask people for an honest, do you, like if you want to build a transferable skill right now that will be useful in five or 10 years, yeah, on people, the web, everyone admits it's HTML, not JSX, everyone. Now, that doesn't mean you don't have to learn JSX if you're using React. Yeah. It's just that everyone doesn't think JSX is going to completely supplant HTML to the point where there is no reason to learn it. Yeah. DOM and HTML are not the same thing, right? Yeah, yes. But, I okay, it might be like a compilation target or something at but some point. I think point. people know that HTML is a thing that authors, users will care about in five years. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yes, yes. Everyone, backend, front people will always say that. I mean, it's, it's, it's just clearly. It's literally what the browser rent, rent like, First, it's the language of the web. Yeah. So it's still, anyways, it's not compilation target ye enough yet that we can't we can ignore it. Um, it's like all I, all the only point was I think it's a unique and good um, and interesting ground to stake in. Um, I think it would be interesting to see what 
to do like almost you almost want to do like a contest and say what is the most compelling 10 minute 15 minute octane power by back end dynamically yes, I agree. Uh, all, all the way through and, and what's wh- which one air table whatever boom boom maybe you have you write a test and you have like a mirage thing that's already that already exists or something like that or you just yeah what, what is that story like what is the most compelling thing you can do with a html first thing that looks very um amenable to someone who is maybe not comfortable with like six years of javascript right so i i think one thing i want to say about the way people think about the blog in 15 minutes is in 20 in 2004 2005 um dhh was like we don't need to build off into rails because it's like pretty easy to do it yourself i actually think that was a mistake in 2005 um because like almost no one can do it but in 2020 i think like pretty clearly people need oauth right now one way like one thing that you could do with that information is you could say oh that what that means is that things have gotten more complicated we cannot expect it to be as easy but that is actually incorrect it's not hard to abstract the auth right it's not hard to make an auth auth a thing that anyone with very little experience can drop in it's just that people are using as an excuse oh things have gotten more complicated it's like look at look at rails it was built on top of like tcp and http and like all this like so many things like unix right it's like the question is not it, the issue is not, oh, it was like the web, it was such a simple time. Everyone, that's like a, it's a well-worn neural pathway. Yeah. Oh, it was such a simple time back then. Like, no, like basically there's nothing about what people are trying to build now. The kinds of things, I'm not talking about like LinkedIn or, um, or Financial mm-hmm. Times. I'm saying Leia. What's Leia trying to build? What is Yehuda of 2005 time travel to now? What are we trying to build? Or even Sam on his his side project on his weekends who has like one tolerance point. Nothing has changed. We're still building Leia's Babies at Work app. We're still building, some people are still building CMSs so that their marketing, their company's marketing portal um, can be edited more by other departments in their company, right? I'm not saying there are no apps that are not like that. There's just still a lot of apps like that. There are a lot. And there's just no reason why why it has become like a thousand Hard. times more complicated. It is more complicated. It's just, it's just I mean, I, 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 maybe one thing that's changed is that is that businesses um, of a sufficient size have chosen to go down this front and back end Yes, I split. agree. 100%. But that was already, that was true in 2005 but also. That was ha- yeah, and that was, well. In 2005, DBAs were a thing. Important yeah. thing. And Rails was like, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get rid of, D- you don't need no DBA. You're starting a small company. Don't think about it like that. And I think that's like thinking that you have to have like a back. This is actually, again, the GraphQL revolution, right? You don't have to think about it like that. The front end developers should be able to like control their own destiny with their own data themselves. I think like I, that, in that case. You really should, by the way, you should look up every Guillermo Rauch podcast and listen I to have, it if you haven't. Because, I follow him yeah, closely. He, he's right, right. He's I, right here. I think the, the only. He disagreed about HTML. Exactly. First, but, I think that's the deal, right? Yeah. I think, I'm not saying that. He actually said in the last episode I listened to of him that he was like React's big innovation was was getting rid of templates. Yes, so I, I, I'm not saying he's wrong or that it means that a beginner. I think it's an interesting. There's you know. just a question. I think if you decide to build on top of React, Next.js is like about twice as popular as Ember. And Next.js is the same scope approximately. If you try to build on top of React, you are handing the React core team the keys to the kingdom in terms of what you can deliver to the customer, that, to the user that we're talking about, right? You're saying, oh, React decided to do hooks. Guillermo was not actually in that room. Guillermo can't decide if hooks is actually a good thing for that user. Guillermo is stuck building the next version of Next.js on top of hooks or abandoning the fact that it's on top of React. And I think yeah. that, like, that is not a free operation. As I, uh, um, I think there's nothing like that's not that I'm not predicting anything. I don't know that it, that it's a failing thing. I just what that's I pretty interesting. I mean, Next is very like it's so much more low level than I originally thought. Um, it is tied to React, but it's not like it. It's not like, um, like, you, did you see this Redwood thing that just came yes. out? That's tied to these technologies. I think if Next you t- has like a, a link that it exposes, and then it has um, like these constant functions that either run on the server or the client to fetch data. Um, and then it yields control over to React, mm-hmm. but it doesn't provide a bunch of like APIs that are built on React because they just, they actually don't, they decided not to like, I think he even said originally they were like, we need to provide like UI components. We need to provide all these things. And he's like, none of this is going to last. Like we want to be a layer below that's like the routing, the code splitting, the minimum bundle per route. And there's a good reason to do that. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. It's just like now, 
you, you know, or like uh, they, they talked about uh, Meteor, right? Which was like way more technology yeah. rich. Actually, it was like you had to have a Mongo back end to use so, it. Meteor was, um, I remember meeting with a Meteor person like a long time ago, and I was like, why don't you guys support like QUnit or like Mocha? And they were, and the person told me, um, we just raised ten million dollars in funding, and we think the experience will be better if we make our own test framework. And I was like, okay, I'm not, I don't care anymore, <laughs> right? Like, be, be, there's just no matter how big you are, there has to be some thing that you share with the surrounding ecosystem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And G Guillermo would certainly, from what, if I had to speak on his behalf, I don't think he would. He's not the kind of person who would say that, right? Right. No, I, yeah, I, yeah, I, I actually yeah, don't. I think yeah. Guillermo is like not is yeah. further to, to, beyond my direction away from Meteor, yeah. right? I think I think Guillermo wants to share React, yeah. right? And I think the, like I think there's a legitimate question like, is Ember taking on too much. I think things like embroider, which we didn't talk about, are trying to shed some of the stuff we do ourselves. I think those things are important. But at the end of the day, like what, in order for us to say we think HTML matters, like yeah. that is an opinion that we have. We cannot have that opinion. You have to come away from the experience feeling like you're getting more than whatever the cost of like learning JSX is, let's say. Yeah. Like you have to. I have to be farther along faster in a sense, in a sense, or, yep. or along some dimension that that matters to me. That, that I get there faster than um, it and would I take to like learn JSX. Like just to wrap like up, like the story that I think we can tell like now-ish is Ember, you, you are a person who is, finds it easy enough to install NPM. You like use Volta, plug for Volta. <laughs> I still um, need to learn that. It's good. Uh, you install it, you install Ember, and you Ember new put in the HTML that you would have typed in any other environment that you would have That's in your index.html file literally on your desktop that you double yes. clicked on. And you put into application.hps. Or from Tailwind UI, I actually just built the Mirage, started building the Mirage demo for the training. And um, this is actually a great example of like betting on HTML because Tailwind UI is like the set of like pre-built components um, that like the creator of Tailwind um, like built and you just get it and it's like um, you just get all the HTML and CSS. It would be like looking at Bootstrap and getting like their hero, but yes. instead of it being like class docs hero, it's like a massive chunk of like HTML and like Tailwind CSS utility classes that you yep. can now tweak every aspect yes. of. But you basically just grab it and put it in the application.hps yes. you and, application and then you're styles. looking at CSS it. It's or pretty cool. CSS. And then you like, it's more, it's more than, then you go to localhost 3000, you run Embrest, localhost 3000, it works, you can edit it however you want. Uh, Add some state, loop over a thing to generate the link. I think, like, basically, like, at first, I think even if you were just there, you didn't add any state yet, and you just run Ember deploy, and now you're, like, a designer, and you could, like, take that link and yeah. give it to your client. Yeah, yeah. That is already a thing. And before you even do anything with JavaScript, you can say, oh, I find it annoying that there's, like, this is a very big file, and I want to break it up into smaller pieces. You could break it up into smaller HTML things and, like, invoke them with, and if maybe you have, you know, you have something that is kind of similar, or you can already, you can still use, you can use arguments. Right in the same way, that, and you can do all that with HTML. I think it, it's easy. I am like quite sure that any designer who knows HTML can learn those things. Those things are small, and again, you can keep Ember deploying, right? And then you're like, oh, I want a little, a little bit of data. I want a little bit of, I want a loop. I want a little bit of um, state to, flow. Yeah, I want to toggle handle, a side right? menu. I remember yeah. when I was a designer and had no programming skills. I just like wanted to make a search box look like a real search box, and it was like really hard, right? So. Like basically you do that and you're like deploying it. Like it's an, a thing on the internet the whole time. And like notice how none of the things in the broader JavaScript discussion like really matter to this use case, right? It's like, oh, I didn't r run very well on my mobile phone in India. It's like, that just didn't matter. Like yeah. not part of this conversation. Yeah, 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 Right. So, definitely not. So that I think like, I'm not saying that those things don't matter. I'm just saying there's an underserved use case and user and that person is underserved because we're spending all of our time on a bunch of other stuff and i think we're in a good position in a good position it really really matters to to go all the way to having it on the internet like i think i think people underrate that like that the story i'm like i'm getting the quick start updated to make sure it includes the whole end-to-end -end induction into the community getting deployed like when you have something on the internet that you can share with people, at least for me when I was starting, that was like such a huge thing. It was such a difference. I will just say again that that, that I think Guillermo shares this value and next and now's I mean, there's a reason Zeit exists. Is, 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 exactly why. There's a reason why uh, a hosting company 
is building a front end framework. The main, <laughs> right? The main like, difference. And at first, you actually think about it. You're like, wait a second. Why? That makes no sense. Like, yeah. But the main difference in me and Guillermo is I do not want people to have to pay for a SaaS product to have part of the experience. Yeah, yeah, And I'm not yeah, saying yeah, that's, that's, that's a fine thing to yeah, do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fine. But I like I think I think we owe it but to the, everybody the, to. The other difference, though, though, is is, is again that this HTML versus the the React yes, coupling. Yes, I mean, um, so that's that's and just, like people um, could like people who are React fans who listen to this can spend can decide that they think it doesn't matter, but it's just not true. I think I think at the, there are just a bunch of people in the world. I've worked with them over the years, who know enough HTML and CSS, and giving them a, a little hop into something more dynamic. Is, is just going to work better than please take a step back and learn JSX, learn Webpack, whatever. That's just, it's just a lot. And I think that doesn't mean it's not, I'm not saying designers can't learn JSX. Empirically, a lot of designers can. The question is, do they have time? Is their company paying for them to do that all day? And I think it, for me, it was such a big deal. I went from PHP to Rails and there's a common the language. starting yeah, that, point was the same. It wasn't a whole new thing. Yeah, the starting yeah. point was the same. Right, that was a big yeah. deal. I will just to finish up. I will say I think if you're listening to this and you have interest in making a compelling case for Ember, I do think like actually the Tailwind UI stuff is is pretty cool idea because it's like hop it's hip right now. Hop, we've been talking for a while. Hop. It's hip right now, and um, it actually demonstrates this value, uh, this benefit of Ember very well that you can literally grab that chunk and it's going to look gorgeous because these things are so well done and um and then like adding like a click is open handler and then like deploying it to like netlify like that would be pretty awesome and if you're thinking this sounds like a sales pitch if ember was able to do that why couldn't why couldn't someone do that before the answer is it actually wasn't possible before octane actually makes it possible and i we just spent a while talking yeah. about it so like that's this, yeah this, this actually, is a real thing yeah this is actually like the fruit of the of all the work yep that's it, it's like as yeah. you, as we said before it's the it's like under the covers what we're actually trying to do right cool so, okay really interesting awesome man well that was a that was a fun conversation as it always is with us whether we're talking about neoclassical economics or neurology neuroscience or neuroscience um or ember and react and all these fun things so um yeah, I'm excited to see the conference over the next few days. Yep. By the way, I I should say, I am like the the values of the Ember community to like do things together and not like give up on each other or um, not give up on doing stuff together that we are doing like makes the Ember virtual conference a thing. And I think it's like not an accident that that Ember is the community is doing it. I think like Ember is awesome and the community is awesome and it's it's great. I'm very happy. Awesome. I'm sure you guys are looking forward to some sleep with you and Leah that, after after this week. I think we have to pick up our kid from school. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thanks for uh, the conversation. And um, thanks for listening, everyone. Mm -hmm.